Hey, everyone. Hi. Oh, hi. I'm, Go uh, ahead, Antonin. <laughs> I'm uh, Antonin. I'm a project, ma uh, project uh, maintainer for a VMware open source project called uh, Project Entrio. And uh, I'm also a staff engineer at uh, VMware. And today I'm presenting with uh, Jian Jun. Hello, everyone. My name is Jian Jun I'm a senior staff engineer at Wemo. I'm also a maintainer of Project Entrio. So we're excited to be here to talk about Kubernetes networking and how to build a Kubernetes network solution. So um, we'll start with some basics of container and Kubernetes networking. We'll talk about what a Kubernetes network plugin provides, how it works, and walk through um, how to implement a Kubernetes network plugin with Open with Switch. That is a well established virtual switch. We also introduce Project Antria which is an open source Kubernetes network plugin based on OpenWay Switch. We have demos about Kubernetes networking, uh, networking with OpenWay Switch and uh, Project Antria. Network visibility is one focus area of Project Antria. We will look into how Antria provides visibility into Kubernetes networks with the support from OpenWay Switch. So let's first look at container and Docker. Containers provide isolated environments to run applications. In the networking front, the isolation is achieved by network namespaces. So each container can have its own network namespace and its own network interface and IP address inside the namespace. The container network interface, uh, namespace is isolated from the host network and other containers. A container cannot see the network interface and the IP addresses of the host and other containers. So there are quite a few ways to connect a container to a, to a network. One popular solution is to use virtual Ethernet devices and the NILAS bridge. So as shown in this diagram, um, you can create a pair of virtual Ethernet devices with one um, inside the container network space to be the container's network interface, Ether zero, and the other connected to the NILAS bridge. So it's like a virtual link between the container and the bridge then the traffic from the container will enter the bridge through the virtual devices, and the bridge will forward the traffic between containers based on their MIC addresses. The NIAS bridge network is also one basic network mode supported by Docker. Docker daemon implements IP address management and allocates one IP address for each container from a local subnet. But since its uh, container subnet is local to a Docker host, the communication of course host might require translating the container IP address to the IP address of the hosts. Then let's look at Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a container orchestration platform. It orchestrates deployment, scaling, and operations of application containers across the class of hosts. Um, a Kubernetes cluster consists consists of masters and worker nodes. The masters run the core control plan services of Kubernetes, including the API server, scheduler, controller manager, and the ETCD store. The API server exposes the SCP API to both applications and to Kubernetes components. Other components, including the scheduler, controller manager, and the components on the worker nodes, will communicate with each other and the they get the, and change the state of the cluster through the API server. The scheduler schedules containers to run on work nodes. And the controller manager includes the a core set of controllers, which implement the core functions of Kubernetes. ETCD is a distributed key value store. It possesses all the state of the cluster. And the worker nodes are the hosts to run application containers. One major Kubernetes daemon on a worker node is Kubelit. It interacts with the container runtime to manage the containers on the node, following the requests from the API server. Kubepost is another daemon run on uh, worker nodes. It implements load balancing for Kubernetes services. In later slides, we'll, we'll talk more about Kubernetes services and the Kubi proxy. Ports are the smallest unit to deploy applications in Kubernetes. A port can include one or more application containers, but all these containers, they share a single IP address and a single network namespace. 
So uh, from networking perspective, a port is a single network entity. And the communication, the internal communication between port, uh, between containers in a single port don't, don't really go through the, net port, uh, the port network. So in a sense, they are very like the IPC uh, between processes in a single operating system. So namespace is another key concept in Kubernetes. Namespace uh, provides a way to divide class resources between, between users. Uh, so note this namespace is a concept in Kubernetes API, not a network namespace we just talked about. So many types of Kubernetes resources must be created under namespace. Within a namespace, names of the resource must be unique, but they need not to be unique across namespaces. For example, uh, in this slide, um, we shoot two namespaces, four and the bar. They both have a port named Redis master and the service named Redis. A Kubernetes service is posted an application by, the, by a set of ports. Uh, for example, in this slide, we show a service is posted as the Redis database, which is backed by, by two Redis server ports. So in Kubernetes, most of the workloads actually will be deployed with services. Within the cluster, a service can be accessed through, it, through a virtual IP allocated by Kubernetes uh, called cluster IP. So this is like a load balance of virtual IP. Service request to the cluster IP will be distributed to the backend ports of the service. We'll introduce the implementation of this service load balancing uh, in our later slides. Also, um, inside the cluster, a service has a DNS name. Ports can look up a service cluster IP from a built-in uh, DNS server in the cluster. So this is a very convenient service discovery mechanism for ports to discover service and uh, look up the cluster IP of the service. So besides access from the inside the cluster, you can also create a service of load balancer type to expose a service to external clients. But in this case, you will need an external load balancer to implement the load balancing for the service. Light policies uh, define how ports are allowed to communicate with each other and other network entities. A light policy selects ports by matching the user defined labels and the ports or namespaces. Uh, this includes the ports to apply the policy or uh, source or destination ports for the traffic. For example, uh, this site shows a simple net policy that allows wipe front end ports to access Redis service provided by the Redis ports on TCP port 6379. I think it's very straightforward to understand. Uh, we will further describe the implementation of policies with open with switch later. At high level, there are three communication paths must be supported in Kubernetes networking. The first is port-to-port -port communication. Each port should get its own IP address and all ports can communicate with other ports on all the nodes using their IP address without net. The second is port-to-service communication. As described earlier, a port should be able to reach a service using the class IP of the service. The last one is the external to service traffic. We talk about it too. A service can be exposed to external clients through an uh, external load balancer or load port. Then come back to the main subject of today's talk, Kubernetes thing and network plugin. So what a Kubernetes network plugin is responsible for? A network plugin imprints the port network, which should support the water three connect connectivity scenarios we just showed in last night. Port to port, port to service, and external to service. It can fix the network interface and allocates IP addresses for the ports. It should support service traffic, uh, but the most Lido plugins don't really implement the load balancing for service, but just work with Kubi proxy for that. A Lido plugin can also implement the Lido policy enforcement, but, don't, uh, but not all the plugins support Lido policies. Last, a Lido plugin can implement traffic shipping, which is, the, uh, is an exper experimental feature of Kubernetes to restrict the network bandwidth of ports. 
So let's first look at Kubelet, which is a little plugin comes with Kubernetes. Kubelet is very simple, just like the Docker bridge network. It connects ports to a Linux bridge using the virtual Ethernet devices. And the wall ports on the node will get the IP address from a single subnet. So for the communication of course nodes, Kubelet itself doesn't really do anything. Uh, so I just relies on the underlying cloud network to route the port traffic between nodes. This will require support from the cloud network and it works on some clouds like AWS, Azure, GCP. It's typically implemented by the Kubernetes cloud provider, which adds a route entry to the cloud network router for each node. That tells the router uh, the port subnet can be reached through the node IP address. Kubernetes doesn't support network policies. Uh, we mentioned the Kubernetes proxy earlier. Uh, it's a daemon runs on every node that imprints load balancing for service of cast IP and the load port tab. For a request from a local client to access a service through its class IP or node port, Kubernetes proxy will intercept the packet, so that one backend port of the service to serve the request and forward the packet to the port. After changing, after, after changing the destination IP address to the port's IP address. So on Linux nodes, Kubernetes proxy supports using IP tables, IPVS, or user space proxy mode to intercept and process the service traffic. It gets the service and the endpoints information from the Kubernetes API server. Uh, for example, with IP tables, Kubernetes proxy creates IP tables, DLAT, and group rules for each service to implement the load balancing of the service traffic. Uh, so far, I uh, went through the Kubernetes networking concepts, introduced the building network plugin Kubelet and the Kubernetes proxy. Last, I will hand over to Anton Ling, um, who will do a deep dive of a single network plugin and how to build a Kubernetes uh, network plugin with Open Research. Uh, thanks, Jianjun. <clears throat> so hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, so uh, Jenjun has mentioned the CNI interface a couple of times, um, the container network interface, but how does it fit into the life cycle of a pod in, in a Kubernetes cluster? Uh, we can look at it step by step. Uh, first, uh, the user creates a pod specification using the Kubernetes API. For example, this can be done by applying a YAML manifest using the kubectl command line tool. Then the Kubernetes control plane is going to select a node in the cluster and schedule the pod onto that node. The Kubelet agent running on the node is going to be notified and is now in charge of creating and running the pod. In order to do so, uh, Kubelet is going to invoke an interface called the Container Runtime Interface, or CRI. Uh, based on the operating system and the container runtime, this is going to involve different things. Uh, on Linux, as Jenjun mentioned, a network namespace is going to be created for the pod. As uh, a container runtime also needs uh, to uh, invoke the container network interface, the CNI interface, uh, with the necessary information to configure networking for the pod and ensure that the pod becomes a part of the cluster network. Uh, this involves creating the primary network interface for the pod, is zero, assigning an IP address to it or multiple IP addresses if you have v4 and v6, potentially configuring routes and so on. The CNI interface is very simple to understand. It has three different commands. Uh, CNI add, which is invoked when the pod is created. CNI delete, which is called when the pod is uh, teared down. And CNI check, which can be called periodically to validate the current network configuration for the pod. On the right-hand side, you can see the API interactions between Kubelet, the container runtime, and the network plugin. So we're going to dive deeper and look at the different steps performed by the CNI plugin. But first, we need to introduce Open vSwitch, also known as OVS, as this is a data plane technology we're going to use as a running example. OVS is a programmable virtual switch. Uh, it's used to connect VMs, virtual machines, or containers. It has been a Linux Foundation project since 2016, is widely used in uh, production, for example, in OpenStack, has a very active developers community and a lot of support for hardware, from hardware vendors. OVS is well integrated into the Linux. Um, the OVS kernel module provides high performance for warding and is available in uh, mainstream Linux since kernel version 3.3. That means that OVS is going to work out of the box in practically all the Linux distributions. 
Uh, OVS is also supported on Windows, which makes it a great choice if you want to use it to build a Kubernetes network plugin, because then you don't have to duplicate software development efforts between Linux and Windows. You can pretty much use the same data pass. Uh, and I said before that OVS was a programmable switch, but what does programmability mean here? Well, OVS can of course be used as a drop-in replacement for the Linux bridge and just do uh, regular switching between containers, but that's not very interesting. What OVS lets you do is it lets you define your own pipeline and choose which packet header fields you want to match on and which actions you want to take as a result of those matches. So thanks to programmability, and we're going to see it in an instant, all the communities network requirements uh, that uh, can be implemented in OVS, all of, the, all of those that uh, Janjun mentioned. That's pod connectivity, network policy enforcement, service load balancing, and, and so on. And unlike the Linux bridge, OVS supports high performance packet IO when you need it, uh, using technologies like DPDK, AFXDP, and possibly hardware offload uh, on supported Nix. So here you have an example of the input parameters that are made available to a CNI plugin. Uh, the arguments specific to the current uh, to the current container, uh, to the current pod being created or being passed as environment variables to the CNI plugin. And you can see those at, at the top here for Kubernetes pod being created. And the network configuration that you see at the bottom is uh, streamed on the standard input when invoking the, is the executable. So let's see how we can use OVS to configure networking for this pod and build a network where all pods can communicate and that satisfies the Kubernetes network requirements. So this is how things look initially on your node. Uh, we assume that we have already created an OVS bridge on each Kubernetes node in the cluster. And we can do that using the command that uh, you can see on the right hand side here. And we're going to call that bridge uh, BRINT, which stands for Integration Bridge. And it's a pretty common name for that kind of virtual network scenario. We're also going to assume that all those nod nodes are running Linux in the cluster. So a network namespace has been created for the pod already by the container runtime. And this network namespace uh, that you can see on the picture has been passed as an argument to our network plugin using an environment variable, as we saw on the previous slide. So the first thing we're going to do and you can see those commands on the right hand side is we're going to enter the pod's network namespace. And from now on, every command we will run will be in that network namespace. And we're going to create a VSP pair. As mentioned earlier, a VSP pair is a standard way of connecting a network namespace to a virtual bridge uh, on Linux. The VS is basically a virtual Ethernet cable, and both ends of the cable, both interfaces, uh, can, can be in their own network namespace. So speaking of which, we will now move one of the two interfaces from the pods network namespace, where we created the vSphere, uh, to the root network namespace uh, of the host. And we can see the command for that on the right hand side. So Kubernetes asked us to use E0 as a network interface a name for the pod. So we need to make sure that we keep E0 in the pods network namespace. Uh, moving on, we will configure the IP address on the E0 interface. Uh, we don't have enough time today to dive into IP address management and how IP addresses are uh, assigned to pods. Um, but the address you can see here, 10.10.1.2, is taken from the subnet, which was included in the network configuration that we passed to the CNI executable on the standard input. And typically in Kubernetes, each node is going to receive one subnet allocated from a larger CIDR, and the CNI plugin running on each node will assign IP addresses from that subnet to pods. Uh, but there are many different IPAM mechanisms that CNI plugins can use to, to accommodate for different use cases. So the last step is we're going to attach the VS interface that we move to the root network namespace uh, to the OVS bridge. And uh, after that, we can use here uh, the OVS VSCTL command line utility uh, to check the bridge configuration. And, and we see that uh, the VS1 port, uh, which connects our pod to the bridge, has been added to the, to the port list. So it's good uh, for the scope of a single pod here, but let's assume that we have just created multiple pods like the previous one on one node, and we want them to be able to communicate. Well, by default, uh, OVS is going to behave like a regular L2 Linux bridge. And in our case, uh, all of those pods here, as we saw previously, are on the same subnet. So they should be able to talk to each other uh, just fine. Um, however, because OVS is a programmable switch, we can do things a little bit better. Uh, for example here, 
we can add some flows to the OVS bridge uh, to prevent IP or ARP spoofing. Uh, flows are how you define forwarding in OVS. So you go, you, in each flow, you match on some parts of the packet headers and you take actions, for example, modify the value of some header field, decrement the TTL, output the packet on a specific port. And if you look at the first command in the, in the blue box, uh, you can see that we add a flow that will match all our packets coming from our pod. And if the IP address, uh, or the MAC address advertised by the uh, and the MAC address advertised by the R packet match what we have configured for the pod previously, then we will forward the traffic normally. If they don't match, we will drop the traffic. So that's great for intranode pod to pod traffic, pods on the same node. But what about pods which are scheduled on different nodes? How do they communicate? Uh, we saw earlier that uh, KubeNet, the default Kubernetes network solution, relies on the cloud provider to program routes into the cloud network fabric. But in our case, we can take an alternate approach and we can build an overlay network with OpenVSwitch. And it's actually pretty straightforward to do. Uh, we can configure tunnels between nodes and we instruct OVS to do forward pod traffic on, on the appropriate tunnel uh, based on the destination IP address. Uh, it's very easy to add a, a node to an overlay network. You can see the command on, on, in the blue box here. And uh, as you create a, a tunnel port to uh, join the overlay network, you can choose which encapsulation protocol you want to use for the overlay. In the example here, uh, we choose to use Geneve. Uh, we take an approach called flow-based tunneling. So instead of creating one tunnel port for each node, uh, on each node for each remote node in the cluster, uh, we create a single tunnel port and then we're gonna uh, add different flows to configure tunneling for the different remote nodes. Uh, we can look at a specific scenario here on the picture uh, and which flows we would need to add to provide internode pod connectivity. Uh, so if you look at node one here, uh, you can see we are running two pods, pod one A and pod one B, and uh, uh, the flows that we need to add uh, to to communicate with the pods on on node two are shown in the in the blue box. Um, an interesting observation is that with our design uh, and our overlay network, we do not send we do not uh, send any broadcast traffic, for example, art traffic across nodes. And this is going to help reduce the amount of uh, traffic overall in the cluster. And it means that we do not have to worry about loops for the overlay network, and we do not have to enable a protocol like a spanning tree. So as a recap, let's take a step back and look at the different packet paths for the different categories of traffic are, that our CNI plugin can handle. So intranode pod to pod traffic is gonna be switched locally by the OBS bridge. For internode traffic, uh, we have built an overlay network and we use encapsulation. Finally, we didn't look at the details of this, but for pod traffic that needs to go outside of the pod network, uh, we can configure IP tables, for example, and use SNAT. Um, to, to masquerade outgoing traffic. The important takeaway here is that the programmability of OVS enables us to implement the entire Kubernetes network model. Up until now, we have been looking at a toy example, uh, looking at how we can use the OVS command line tools to configure the pod network. Uh, but Jenjin is now going to introduce you to a real life Kubernetes network plugin, uh, which was built with OVS. So while I'm telling, uh, just described how to implement Kubernetes networking with OpenVSwitch. switch. There are actually many other implementations of CNI plugins using different technologies. On the CNI project page, there are totally 26 third-party plugins listed besides a few core plugins maintained by the CNI project. Um, so in this slide, I would give a high-level overview of several little plugins built with different technologies, including Antria, Calico, Celia, and Flano. So Antria use OpenVSwitch switch as a network data plan. Almost all its features are implemented using OpenVSwitch. switch. Calico use BGP to implement routing of port traffic and leverage IP tables for network policy enforcement. Uh, since the recent version 3.16, it also supports eBPF for network policies. Cilean's data plan implementation is mainly based on eBPF. Fnano is another popular network plugin um, it's very simple and then um, uh, leverage the NIDAS bridge for connecting ports to the network. So for network port, let, uh, sorry, for port network, uh, all the four plugins support overlay with different tunnel protocols. 
and they uh, also for the low encapsulation mode that leverage the cloud network to resolve the traffic between nodes. Calico additionally supports BGP routing and can change results with the underlay network routers using BGP when that is supported by the underlay network. In Antria, uh, land policy are enforced by Open Research 2. Different from other implementations, Antria does centralized land policy computation in which a single controller computes a light policy and disseminates them to the relevant nodes, instead of having every node watch policies and compute locally. We have more details about the light policy implementation in Antria later. Calico leverages IP tables for uh, or eBPF to enforce light policies. Cilian use uh, eBPF only, and Flano doesn't support light policies. Except Cilian, uh, there are other three, uh, the other three plugins uh, support Kubernetes on Windows too. Uh, Antria still leverages open with switch on Windows nodes. Calico chance to use Windows building BGP implementation and it uses Windows virtual filtering platform for that policies. Flano also supports Windows with the uh, uh, Windows bridge and overlay drivers. There are also a few little plugins uh, built for specific cloud platforms like AWS, Azure, GCP, or NST. These plugins implement port network connectivity with cloud native network. For example, they might just call a cloud API to create networks and allocate IP address for the ports from the network. So as stated earlier, Project Entry has an open source network plugin for Kubernetes that uses open with switch as the network data plan. So last, uh, we will go a little deeper with Project Antria and use it to further demonstrate Kubernetes networking with Open with Switch. Um, Antria is still a young project that has an It has picked up some momentum already. One main goal of the Project Antria is to provide a good user experience. It's very simple to deploy and manage and it provides tooling for network diagnostics and the fine-grained visibility. We will see this as part from our demos later. Antria can run anywhere across runs, private clouds, public clouds, edge, uh, Elas and Windows nodes. Thanks to the good portability of open switch, Antria supports all these platforms and working systems with the unified implementation. Besides Quest Network Policy, Antria also provides a, a native secret, secret policies and builds a comprehensive policy model. So this study shows the Antria components and how they fit the Antria agent runs on every node using a Kubernetes debug set. It manages the OS bridge on the node, takes care of a port network interface configuration. It handles the CNI calls from Kubernetes and creates virtual Ethernet devices for new ports and connects them to the OS bridge. It creates overlay tunnels, influence traffic forwarding, network policy enforcement, and functions can be implemented with open research and open flow. So in a sense, Antria Agent just automates the OS configuration and the open flow programming based on the information from Kubernetes and Antria controller. For example, it watches node service and the points from Kubernetes API server, gets the port subnet to node IP mapping to create tunnels to remote nodes, and gets endpoints of a service to create a service load balancing flows uh, in open research with open flow. The other major component is Antria Controller, which runs as a Kubernetes deployment. Antria Controller watches Kubernetes uh, letter policies from the API server, transforms them, and disseminates them to the relevant Antria agents. We have a slide later to talk more about the letter policy implementation in Antria. Uh, what's to mention, uh, Antria Controller leverages Kubernetes API server library to build a high performance communication channel to agents and also to expose Kubernetes style API. The channel can scale pretty well. Actually, we try to leverage Kubernetes technologies as much as possible uh, when we build Antria. 
the strategy together with the open way switch reduced the implementation complexity a lot and enabled us to um, add more features for cross networking at a very fast pace. All the entry components, including the controller agent and even OS demons are containerized and they can be deployed by applying a Kubernetes manifest with a single line of command. Thank you, Jenjun. Uh, so now that uh, Jenjun introduced uh, everyone to project entry, I wanna show a short uh, uh, demo video of how to deploy entry on a cluster. So hopefully everyone can see the video now. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm creating a cluster uh, right now using a tool called KOps on AWS EC2. Uh, there are many different tools, both open source and, and commercial to create cluster like this. Uh, so it only takes a few minutes to create a, a multi-node cluster and uh, I, I uh, skipped forward here uh, so that we don't have to wait. But once it's done, I can use kubectl to access my cluster. And here I'm looking at the uh, different nodes in the cluster. Uh, you can see that they are in the not ready state and that's because I haven't deployed a network plugin to my cluster yet. So I'm gonna download Entria. Um, right now I'm just looking at the Entria YAML manifest. As uh, Jenjun said, everything can be done by applying a single manifest and I'm quickly editing some uh, configuration parameters to enable some alpha level features which are disabled by default. Once this is done, uh, I just need to apply the YAML, which is going to create all the Kubernetes resources uh, need, uh, needed for Entria. And after that, we can watch the pods. And we can see we have three Entria agent pods, one per node, and one Entria controller pod, which is like the centralized network policy computation engine. Uh, it takes about a minute for everything to become ready here because the Docker image has to be pulled from a Docker Hub and, and, and so on. Uh, but after that, uh, we can see that all the DNS services are ready. And if we look at the nodes again for the cluster, we can see that those nodes are now ready because my network plugin is uh, has been installed and is running. Um, so what I'm doing here is I want to deploy some pods, uh, some web server pods, three of them as a deployment uh, to my cluster, just as an example to see how networking is configured for them. So I'm looking at those pods they are running. I can see on which nodes they're running. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select one of those uh, uh, nodes here. I think the one with the IP address that ends in 201. And I want to find out which agent pod is running on that node. So that would be that one. And now I can exec into that pod. More precisely, I'm going to exec into the entry OVS container for that pod, which runs the OVS daemons. And I'm going to inspect a few things. So we can use OVS VS CTL to look at the bridge. And we can see that we have one port for each one of our web server pods running on that node. We have like a gateway port. We didn't get into the details of that. And we have the tunnel port, uh, which makes sure that the node becomes part of the overlay network. We can also dump all the OVS flows for that bridge. And we can see that even with a small number of pods, that can be quite a long list, uh, which is why for Entria, we've built some command line utility, which is called ncarl, uh, to help with uh, troubleshooting and inspecting the network configuration on the node. So here I'm looking at some available command and one of them is get pod interface uh, to print information about uh, the, the VS interface for local pods. And we can see once again, our two web server pods with their IP address and MAC address and web port ID. We can also look at the different flows uh, in, in a way that's a bit more structured than with uh, co uh, OVS command line tools directly. So here I'm going to dump the flows for a specific web server pod. And we can see I only get a list of four flows. Uh, those flows are dedicated to uh, to, the, to that pod. I'm going to stop the video here. Um, and let's go back to the slides. Um, now moving on to network policy implementation. And Jenjun already talked a lot about this and I don't want to get into too many details uh, for uh, the sake of time. But I think the, the key takeaway here is that we have a centralized approach in, in Entria uh, because we see multiple advantages to that. Uh, one of them is that we reduce the amount of computation that each agent on each node has to perform. And we reduce the load on the Kubernetes API server by having a single entity, the controller, uh, connect to the Kubernetes API. Um, and so, uh, yeah, as Jenjun mentioned, to distribute computed internal policy objects, 
uh, we use uh, a, the Kubernetes API server library. So the same library which is used to run the main Kubernetes API. And uh, uh, using this enabled us to achieve a very performant communication channel with little engineering effort. Uh, so I'm going quickly because I want to be able to show the, all the demo videos. So if I move on to the second one, uh, which is also pretty short, uh, it, it kind of like dives deeper into uh, network policies. So once again, we have our web server uh, deployment. Uh, we have also a couple web clients and a couple of other clients which are named and labeled other clients here. And you will understand why in a second. So I'm gonna apply those uh, two deployments to create the web clients and the other clients. And uh, let's look at the pods. Uh, so we can see that we have all those pods running, servers, clients, other clients. So I'm gonna exec into one of the web clients that I'm selecting randomly here. And once I'm exec into it, I'm gonna try to do an HTTP request uh, to the web server service, uh, which can, I can use, uh, I can do using a DNS name in Kubernetes. And you can see, okay, I can, I can, I can see the Nginx uh, welcome message. Uh, so everything uh, is working fine. Let's try with one of the other clients. I'm gonna do the same thing, the same exact uh, curl request, which is again gonna succeed, which makes sense because I haven't added any network policies to my cluster. So all communications between all pods are allowed. But now I'm gonna imply, apply this network policy to all my web server pods. And it's an ingress network policy. And what it says is, okay, the web servers can only receive traffic from the web clients, not from the other clients, and only on TCP port 80. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply that network policy and then we're gonna do exactly what we just did uh, with the kubectl exec command and, and the call requests and see how things have changed. So from the web client, nothing has changed. We can still access the web service without any issue. We still see the Nginx welcome message. But if we exec into the other client and we try to do the same curl request again, we can see that now it hangs. I'm not getting the, uh, the web page and that's because all the uh, traffic is being dropped by OVS. Um, what I wanted to show as well is the Octant UI, which is a web dashboard for communities. So by default, it shows information about all the pods, for example, all the services. Here, I'm looking at one of the entry agent pod and I'm looking at the logs. It's nice to be able to look at the logs in a web UI in a centralized place. Uh, however, for Entria, we built an Octon plugin, which is used to display some specific information about Entria. So here, what you see is some runtime information about the Entria agents and the Entria controller, what's the bridge, what's the node subnet, how many pods are running on each node, um, and what is the status of each agent and controller. But more interestingly, we have built a feature called TraceFlow, which lets you send traced packets through the Kubernetes network that we've created with OVS and see what happens to those packets. So here I'm generating one trace, one trace request from a web client to the web server service on port 80. I'm gonna hit submit and we're gonna see that it takes a bit of time to run, but here I'm gonna get a graph eventually of the path taken by the packet uh, through the cluster. Um, and you can see that the packet goes from one source node to a destination node, and you can see the different components of the pipeline uh, traversed by the packet. Uh, so that's, that's all good because we know that web clients can talk to web uh, servers here, but let's start a new trace where instead of using a web client as a source, we use one of the other clients as a source. The rest of the trace request is exactly the same, same destination, same port. Let's run the, the, the new request again. And oh, what do we see? Okay, the graph is like different, right? Because now we're dropping the packet on the destination node uh, because of an ingress network policy, the ingress network policy rules that we've defined uh, using YAML. So a cool feature we have in Entria is the concept of network policy stats, where we can dump stats about uh, the number of sessions and the number of packets which have been allowed by a specific network policy. And that's what I'm showing here. I'm showing uh, the stats for our policy, uh, WebNP, and we see the number of bytes, packets, and sessions allowed by this policy. Now let's exec into the client, do a new request, and let's look at those stats again. And here, 
uh, we see that the stats haven't changed. So I'm going to use watch and I'm going to periodically look at those uh, uh, stats. Look, we're at six sessions in a moment, it should change to seven. And that's because to avoid overloading the cluster, we only report stats asynchronously, like every minute or so, uh, to avoid generating too much control traffic. All right, that was all for this uh, demo video. Um, uh, I need to go fast, I think. Um, basically, I wanted to show an overview of the OVS pipeline used by Entria, uh, so you can understand that it's kind of like one, one big step away from the toy examples that we were looking at previously in the presentation. So some of the forwarding stages, the blue boxes, the blue rectangles that you see here, uh, uh, should be familiar from our running example previously. You, you have the spoof guard table, uh, to prevent uh, ARP and IP spoofing. You have the L3 forwarding table, which is how uh, we uh, send traffic on the correct tunnels uh, as part of overlay routing. And the reason why I'm showing this is to emphasize that the OVS pipeline can become quite complex, uh, which is why with Entria, we've been looking into different tools and integrations uh, to provide visibility into the network. Uh, we just talked about the middle one here, the Octant one, but I want to highlight uh, two other ones, which is Prometheus, uh, the fact that in Entria, uh, we have the different components, agents and controller export Prometheus metrics, which can then be collected and visualized. And our Elastic Stack integration. Um, so every Entria agent is going to export information about the flows in the cluster network using a standard export protocol called IPFIX. And this information can then be collected, analyzed, and visualized using the LK stack. And I'm going to show one more quick video uh, of how this works in practice. Um, so if we go back to our cluster, this is the same cluster as before, uh, we're going to apply uh, a new YAML manifest and create some workload pods, uh, web clients and web servers. But this time we're going to generate a lot of connections between them with a lot of traffic being uh, sent and received. So we have a lot of ongoing traffic in that cluster. And if I look at the monitoring name namespace for my cluster, I can see that I have a bunch of stuff related to Prometheus uh, because I've already deployed this in my cluster. Uh, and that's not shown in the video. But what we can notice is that uh, what's highlighted here is that we have a Prometheus service running uh, as a node port servlet, which means we can access it outside of the cluster on port 30,000. So here I'm jumping into Grafana, which is a UI to visualize Prometheus metrics. And I'm going to add as a data source my Prometheus service from my cluster on port 30,000. This is all very straightforward. I'm going to save the data source. And now I can go ahead and I'm going to create a dashboard to visualize a specific metric in my cluster. Um, uh, changing a few parameters for the demo here. And the metric I'm going to choose is Entria agent contract Entria connection count, which shows the total number of connections committed to contract by the Entria agent on a specific node. And that's something that's interesting to see because uh, it it's a very e a common issue in Kubernetes clusters that you can reach the maximum occupancy for a contract and then new connections are going to be dropped, uh, which is going to affect your connectivity. Um, and let me move forward here. Uh, we also have that feature for flow export information where we send connection information to uh, the LK, ELK stack and uh, a specificity of entry is we add Kubernetes related information to those IP fix records about source pod name, destination pod name, uh, source pod namespace, destination service. And thanks to that extra information, we can visualize some flow maps, not in terms of destination IP, source IP, but in terms of Kubernetes objects, which pods are talking to which other pods, what the bandwidth for each service, and so on. Uh, Sorry. So yeah, here we go. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm going to skip the conclusion, but the idea here is that uh, we're able to build a Kubernetes network blocking by leveraging OVS uh, in actually less than a year, uh, thanks to uh, the programmability of OVS, its portability, uh, thanks to the Kubernetes uh, libraries that we've been able to leverage to build an efficient control plane. And we have a very ambitious roadmap. Uh, we're happy to uh, get new contributors and guide them. And I have some community information here. Feel free to reach out if you want to contribute or if you try entry and you run into any issue.
Thank you, Antonin. And thank you, Jen Jen. We will see you guys later. Thank you for attending this All Things Open 2020. Really appreciate your time and your attendance. And I guess we'll see you next time.